a reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Stephen, filled with grace and power, was working great wonders and signs among the people. Certain members of the so-called synagogue of freedmen, Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and people from Cilicia in Asia, came forward and debated with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he spoke. Then they instigated some men to say, We have heard him speaking blasphemous words against Moses and God. They stirred up the people, the elders, and the scribes, accosted him, seized him, and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They presented false witnesses who testified. This man never stopped saying things against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him claim that this Jesus, the Nazarene, will destroy this place and change the customs that Moses handed down to us. All those who sat in the Sanhedrin looked intently at him and saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Blessed are they who follow the law of the Lord. Though princes meet and talk against me, your servant meditates on your statutes. Yes, your decrees are my delight. They are my counselors. I declared my ways, and you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts, and I will meditate on your wondrous deeds. Remove me from the way of falsehood, and favor me with your law, the way of truth I have chosen. I have set your ordinances before me. Dominus Fabiscum. Et ut spiritus tuum. Exil Sancti Evangelii secundum Ioannem. Gloria ti After Jesus had fed the five thousand men, his disciples saw him walking on the sea. The next day, the crowd that remained across the sea saw that there had only been one boat there, and that Jesus had not gone along with his disciples in the boat, but only his disciples had left. Other boats came from Tiberias, near the place where they had eaten the bread when the Lord gave thanks. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into boats and came to Capernaum looking for Jesus. 
And when they found him across the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered them and said, Amen, amen, I say to you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him the Father, God, has set his seal. So they said to him, what can we do to accomplish the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one he sent. Verbum Domini. It was during the Second World War that those who were caring for the children in an orphanage in England discovered that the children weren't sleeping. In their young lives as orphans, they had often gone hungry and they were fearful that the next day they would not have anything to eat. And so they had trouble sleeping. And so they came up with a solution, those who were caring for them. They would give the children a piece of bread to hold during the night. It wasn't to be eaten then. They already had the food necessary for that day. But it was to be held until the next day so they would, they would know that they would have some bread for the next day. And they began to sleep peacefully with that knowledge. And we can think of that in relation to our Lord's words in today's gospel as we're considering the bread of life discourse, John chapter six, where he says, do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures to, for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. And so the natural food that we need to, to sustain our earthly life is not sufficient to give us supernatural life. It's not sufficient to preserve us from death. But there is a food that will be given to us that does give us supernatural life, that is sufficient to preserve us through death, beyond death. And that is a food the Son of Man gives to us that will see us through the night of death to the next day, to the eternal day with God forever. The bread of life, the bread of the Holy Eucharist that is our gift. We know that often the last sacrament that people receive as they're dying is the anointing of the sick. And this is often because they reach a state, perhaps they're comatose, where they're not able really to respond. But ideally, the last sacrament that we would receive is viaticum, the Holy Eucharist. Viaticum meaning the food for the journey to help us in that journey through the night of death to the eternal day. And on two occasions, I've had the opportunity to celebrate a mass of viaticum, which is something, it's rare, but it's something that can be, be offered. Once for one of the sisters in Hansville who was dying and it was just a few days before her own death and once for uh, Lee Hines' wife here, who, who often attends our daily mass here. And it's a very moving thing that you realize the significance of what the Lord said, that the food that we have here perishes, but the food that he gives us is going to sustain us into eternal life. That's the treasure and the gift of the Eucharist. One of those who lived in London during the First World War and Second World War, in fact, he himself fought during the First World War. He lost all but one of his close friends 
in a bitter battle in the First World War. He taught at Oxford for many years, including during the Second World War. His name is J.R.R. Tolkien. And his own mother had converted to Catholicism, and because of that, she was very much persecuted for her faith. She had many struggles in her life, but what was important to her, one of the things that was important to her was handing on the faith to her children. And this was something that J.R. Tolkien always remembered with, with a great affection for his mother and the sacrifices she made and how important her own Catholic faith was that she clung to her conversion to it. And in a letter to one of his sons, he said this. He said, out of the darkness of my life, so much frustrated, I put before you the one great thing to love on earth, the blessed sacrament. There you will find romance, glory, honor, fidelity, and the true way of all your loves upon earth, which every man's heart desires. So he had a profound love for the Holy Eucharist. What he says, it's the true way of all loves. It's what every heart, man's heart desires, the treasure of the Eucharist. There was a priest that profoundly affected his life and influenced him for the good, Father Francis Morgan. And he helped their family out in a very difficult time. He said, he was more than a father to me. And that he was the first one who taught me charity and forgiveness. His own son, J.R. Tolkien's son, became a priest as well. And to one of his other sons, Christopher, he wrote about uh, an event, that a, a sermon that he had heard on one occasion that deeply affected him. And he began to see something very clearly that he hadn't really recognized before. And this was when this priest was talking about the raising of Jairus's daughter from the dead and how after this little girl had been raised from the dead, Jesus said, give her something to eat. And so this priest was commenting on and illustrating that with a story that happened in Lourdes and how there was a little boy that was brought to Lourdes by his parents and he was dying of tubercular peritonitis. And of course, they went there full of hopes that he would receive a healing there, a place where many people have uh, had their health restored. But they left disappointed and sad because there was no miracle that they experienced while they were there on the grounds of Lourdes. And so they got on the train to return home, and there were nurses attending him as he was close to dying. And as the train passes the grotto for the last time, the little boy suddenly sees a little girl that had actually been healed at Lourdes, and he said, I want to go talk to her. And he hadn't been able to walk before, and he gets up and he walks over to her and talks with her and plays with her. Then he returns back to his seat with his parents. He says, I'm hungry. And he hadn't been able to eat for so long. They gave him two huge meat sandwiches which he devoured. And so what uh, J.R. Tolkien coined a word for that event and it suddenly struck him that that was something that he was trying to communicate in some of the stories that he wrote. You know, his fiction works are the largest selling books in history, The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. And he coined a word, you catastrophe. And it comes, this will be a challenge for our Spanish translators. That's catastrophe with EU in the front of it. Catastrophe means to overturn. And U means happy or some good. So it's a happy overturning. That there's this expected, he said, there's an apparent sad ending and then there's a sudden unhoped for happy ending that comes about, a U catastrophe. He said, for I coined the word you catastrophe, the sudden happy turn in a story which pierces you with a joy that brings tears. It is a sudden glimpse of truth. 
that your whole nature chained in material cause and effect, the chain of death, feels a sudden relief as if a major limb out of joint had suddenly snapped back. It perceives that this is indeed how things really do work in the great world for which our nature is made. And I concluded by saying that the resurrection was the greatest eucatastrophe possible and produces the essential, that essential emotion, Christian joy, which produces tears. It comes from those places where joy and sorrow are at one. And he had this insight, you know, at the end of The Lord of the Rings, that Sam believes that Frodo has died and he thinks that that's, there's no hope for his survival either, and he falls asleep. And then he awakes and he's on a soft bed. And he's wondering if everything was just a dream before and suddenly he realizes he sees Frodo's finger missing. He realizes, no, it all happened but he expected that they were all dead. And so he says to Gandalf, who he thought was also dead, and he sees him alive, he says, is everything sad going to come untrue? And so in this, he's pointing out that in this life, we're gonna have trials. J.R. Tolkien suffered World War I, World War II, things, uh, great tragedies. And yet, what is the end of the story? Is every sad, everything sad going to come untrue? And the answer is yes. That the resurrection points to that reality. And J.R. Tolkien said in that moment, he had just this understanding that this was true. It wasn't something that he had kind of logically come to as we often do and we, we reason about things, but it was something that he just had this, what he called a direct appreciation of the mind. It's like this infused understanding, this in intuition that understands clearly this really is the way things are. That ultimately everything sad is going to come untrue. And that the resurrection points to that fact, to that truth. That we ourselves too are going to share in the Lord's resurrection. And he gives us this food, this food that endures to eternal life. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. That's the treasure that is ours, the gift of the Holy Eucharist, that a little bit of that resurrected life is imparted to us. We have a little foretaste, O sacrum convivium, O sacred banquet, in which Christ is received, the memory of his passion is recalled, the pledge of future glory is given. We're given a little foretaste of that eternal life, that we know that this is that food that enables us not to perish, but to pass through that dark night of death and to come to eternal life. There's recently been a book written about Pope Benedict by an Italian, Andrea Monda. And I don't think it's been completely translated, but I have a few excerpts from that book. He wrote about how often Pope Benedict has spoken about joy. And he said, I think if you looked at how frequently he spoke about things, you'd find he talked about joy a lot perhaps more often than anything else. In fact, his recent uh, message for World Youth Day was on that very topic, on joy. And he has this quote from, a couple of quotes from Pope Benedict. And here's one of them. Simple, genuine joy has become more rare. The world does not become better if it is deprived of joy. The world needs persons who discover the good, who are capable of feeling joy because of it, and in this way also receive the prompting and the courage to do good. We need that original trust 
which ultimately only faith can give, that in the end, the world is good, that God exists and is good. From this stems also the courage of joy, which becomes in turn a responsibility so that others may also rejoice and receive the glad tidings. That's beautiful. That we need, he said, people that can see, that can take delight in the good. That in the end, the world is good, that God exists and is good. And it gives us courage to do good, to have the courage of joy. That we know that in the end, that everything sad is going to be made untrue. That in the delight of the resurrection that is promised to us and the food that the Son of Man gives us so that we won't perish but we'll have eternal life is going to lead us to that place. So may the Lord help us to live in that hope and joy always. After Holy Communion today, this will be our prayer, the prayer that I will offer for all of us. Almighty, ever-living God, who restore to us eternal life and the resurrection of Christ, increase in us, we pray, the fruits of this Paschal Sacrament and pour into our hearts the strength of this saving food. Through Christ our Lord, amen.